Christians, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. For this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God." You may be seated. Well, in this day and age, um, feedback is a big deal. Reviews are very important, and what people are saying and um, online about your business or organization. It's very important people spend a lot of money to make sure that reviews that people leave are good. Well, what if Jesus Christ wrote a review of our congregation? What if he sent a letter? What would our good points be? What would the strengths be? What would be our weaknesses? Several weeks ago, uh, my wife and I attended the parent-teacher conferences at the school uh, across the street and at Faith High School where our children attend. And during those meetings with the teachers, uh, we were given a report card. And it showed the average grade so far this year. Um, we discussed with the teachers ways that we could assist our children in improving those grades. Um, but it was very enlightening for us to spend a few minutes with uh, with the teachers, evaluating our children, how they're doing in school, and maybe even evaluating ourselves, how are we doing in assisting them. We also did some detective work um, as well. We discovered that one of the reasons that one of our students didn't complain about missing a lunch several days in a row is because he was racking up quite a bill at the food stand. And um, it's also helpful to learn that um, the yellow slips are not just handed out willy-nilly as some uh, students think they might be, but probably comes after several days or maybe a week of uh, reminders to keep your shirt tucked in. One of the most interesting things that we learned or that we were concerned about is how are children related to other people, other classmates? Are they respectful to their teachers? In addition to the, being concerned about their grades, we're concerned about their attitudes. Do they participate in class in a healthy way? Are they doing their best? And there's a, report, a, a portion on the report card where the teacher can um, fill in some information on how, they are, uh, how their attitude and behavior is. Now, this second part of the report card, I would say, is way more important than your GPA. Uh, apparently, um, when I was in school, I was notorious for not putting much effort into my work. And I know this because almost every teacher I ever had told me this. So often we can benefit from just taking a few minutes and in retrospect, looking back over areas of our life and seeing where we need to improve. What attitudes do I need to adjust to? What sins do I need to repent of? And as a congregation, I believe it's also important for us to just stop and take some time to discover what is our strength? What are our weaknesses? Where do we need to improve? The church has a specific role and purpose in our community. Are we filling those needs? And scripture has some things to say about what the church is and what the church should be doing. And we want to take a look at some of those and see how we are doing. The church in Ephesus received a, le a letter de detailing some of their strengths and some of their weaknesses. So we want to look at scriptures uh, that teach us how we should live as a church. Now, uh, we claim that we are a part of the church, and we come to church, and we've been hearing a lot about leadership with the recent ordination and pastors, 
But sometimes I think we forget what church is for, or what church is about. When a physical body is unhealthy, growth and healing and maturity or maturing are diminished. And when the individual cells of a body attack each other, there is physical death. And when we as members of the church attack each other, there is also decay and sometimes spiritual death as a result. Now, I can also apply these things to my personal life. How am I, as a member of this body, the church, how am I doing? How does my report card look? Are the activities that I'm involved with even closely lining up with Scripture? Is my attitude, uh, does my attitude need to be adjusted or changed? Is there repentance that needs to happen in my life? Romans 12, 5 says, So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. And Ephesians 4, 16, From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So let's take some time to think. Let's fill in a mental report card of our church, and maybe this will be less of a sermon and just more uh, reflecting and seeing where we could do better. And also, where could I improve and what needs to change in my life? And as a reminder, I don't think we should actually focus as much on the grade that we give ourselves as a church or as an individual as to the attitudes and priorities that need to be changed in order to make those adjustments. And I will um, use my own report card as an example of this. Now, I know a lot of you, and this is actually my report card for fifth grade, I know a lot of you are seeing C's and D's, but I would like to point out to you that depending where you look on this card, I am a straight A student. It's down towards the bottom, but it's there, straight across the bottom. Now, the reason I wanted to show this because uh, my grades were very poor this year, worse than they have been uh, before or since, and there's a reason. If you look in the upper left-hand corner under work habit, there's a line that says uses time to good advantage, and there is a minus in that box. So this particular year, the teacher decided that when you were finished with your homework, you could gather as friends and play games. Uh, I did my homework in record time each and every day. And you can see what the results were. And this is an example of when we look back at our lives and see areas that need to improve, it's important to look deeper at our attitude and priorities um, and see where we went wrong. So this is seventh grade, and I have greatly improved. And if you'll notice where it says, uses time to good advantage, uh, Martha Esch uh, at the time, now Bang, was very gracious in giving me a plus. It may look like a minus, but it's a plus. <laughs> and so my grades, as a result, were improved. In eighth grade, um, apparently I used time to good advantage. I received a plus, but I received a negative uh, minus in accurate work being done. Uh, and I'm not sure how that's possible, but it uh, seems like an oxymoron. So this has sort of uh, followed me throughout my life, and even yesterday as I was preparing for this sermon, there came a time and a point where I thought, you know what, uh, it may be time just to go outside and play, and um, it's sort of my personality. What does a healthy church look like, and what are some activities that we should be involved in? I'm going to look at five. I've actually squeezed nine of them in, but I've condensed it to five. Um, just to trick your minds into thinking that it's a shorter sermon. And so we want to look at these uh, five areas. First of all, a healthy church is placed under authority. And again, we've heard a lot about leaders and qualifications of leaders recently, but um, Paul says that in Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put uh, 
what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. In Acts 20, 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with, with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So the church is to be led by men who will watch out for the flock to prevent false teaching and perverse doctrine, to guard against the wolf or the wolves who come to kill and destroy the flock. In Acts 14, 23, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. The church of Christ is led by qualified leaders. And I believe the success of the leader is dependent on how willingly he responds to admonition and even unfound criticism. The leaders as well operate under God's authority and at times their attitudes and priorities need to be adjusted. King Saul was in authority under God, but because of his disobedience, he overstepped his authority and his kingdom was taken from him. King David was a leader and a man after God's own heart, and he sinned greatly. And God in his mercy sent Nathan the prophet to uh, tell him, to remind him, and gave him a simple message. You are the man that has sinned and deserves death. And David humbled himself and repented, as should we when we sin. Moses needed advice of a father-in-law to help him see what, that he was taking too much work on himself. The tremendous leader that Moses was needed some coaching in the area of healthy balance of workload and delegation. What grade would you give the leaders of this church? Now, be gracious. What grade would you give yourself as the leader of your home, your business, or the rules that God has given you within the church? Have you been protecting against the wolves? Have you been guarding your family from heresy? Are you providing a level of protection and are you providing for the spiritual needs of those that God has placed in your care? Are you a teachable leader? Are you approachable? Repentance and a change of heart is not a sign of weakness. Rather, it is the work of Christ in our lives that allows us to change and grow in him. The church also needs to submit to governing authority. In 1 Peter 2, it talks about the need to submit. It says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall, be behold, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God, honor all men, Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And it goes on to say that, For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, but... When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who, had, who his own self bare our sin in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye he were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, 
but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So the church is to submit to governing authority. From the president down to the governor, down to the township and local law enforcement, the teaching in verse 13 is clear. Submit. Submit to every ordinance in verse 14. Submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. He even says that when we're disciplined by earthly authority for doing right, this is our calling because Christ also did this for an example for us to follow. In verse 20, it is acceptable with God that we suffer patiently at the hand of earthly authority. And in verse 12, our honest submission to authority is a way for God to be recognized by our neighbors. If we do this, we put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, Peter was known for his strong language, and perhaps um, some of you may be thinking, well, this is um, just Peter speaking. We don't actually need to submit to our local authorities. After all, we are the church of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul says in Romans 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive of themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for, if, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, Honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Paul agreed with Peter that we are to submit to God ordained ministers of earthly authority. All power comes from God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. If we resist, the earthly power, we are resisting God who placed them there and will receive damnation, we're told in Romans 13. We are to pay taxes, we are to pay custom, we are to pay fear, reverence, and honor to the rulers that God has placed over us. He has given them authority and power and they are his ministers. Separation of church and state does not give the church or its people a free pass. We are not to disregard and dishonor the authority that God has placed over us. As a church, if we are not submitting to this God-ordained authority, can we really call ourselves a church? How am I doing in the area of submission? How are we doing as a church in submitting to the authority that God has ordained to be over us? How am I doing? The church is also a place of gathering. In Matthew 18, 20, it says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And I'm not sure that the important thing is that there are two or three, but that they are gathering. They are together. And the church gathers together. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, we as humans have been created for community. And it is dangerous for an individual to feel alone, to feel isolated or disconnected from from a group. We must be intentional about spending time together. Now, I think you would understand it would be absurd for me to say that I love my wife and then move to the other side of the country and just visit her on holidays or occasionally. 
That may be equally as, as absurd for us to say that we are part of the church, but neglect to gather, neglect to be part of the group. And it's more than just being in close proximity. I think it's true that the loneliest place to live is in the same house as another person that you are unconnected to, that you are emotionally disconnected from. If we fail to gather together, if we fail to work together, and if we fail to pull together, we can, really, can we really say that we are a church? The church is also to be a place of healing. In James chapter 5, verse 14, it says, is anyone, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The church is to be a place of physical and spiritual healing. We should make every effort to point people to the healer, Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Following the example and teaching of Christ in the example that he gave of the Samaritan, we should be binding up more wounds. We should be providing for the hurting, and we should be providing for the needs of those who need healing. Too often, I'm not participating in healing. I'm passing by on the other side. I'm avoiding those who need healing. Like the priest and the Levite, I'm too busy or too distinguished or too selfish to enter in. It's an inconvenience to my day or my life, and they go, I avoid them. God forbid that the church ever become a place of hurt rather than healing. And we possibly get much closer to this than we even know. Abuse and hurt should not be a part of the church. We should wage war against abuses of all kind. The church is to be a place of rest and healing, not abuse and neglect. And my prayer is that God would spare us from these abuses and neglects and give us courage and power to be the place of healing physically and spiritually. There's need for relational healing. In Matthew 18, verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the, even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And I think the, the idea or uh, insinuated here is that the church is to be an avenue for mediation in relationships. We should help people rebuild relationships. Too often we give up on each other rather than rebuild relationships. How are we doing in the area of reconciliation, in re relational mediation? When there's a wedge in a relationship, do we work at removing it or do we pick up the hammer and drive it deeper? Part of healing is to repair relationships. And the way we relate to each other is, is so important because I believe our relationships to each other are directly connected to how we relate to God. The attitude that we have towards our brothers and sisters is similar or the same as our attitude towards God. And when our attitude towards God is wrong, our attitude towards our brothers and sisters will be wrong as well. Kindness and long-suffering and gentleness and peace and goodness and meekness are all gifts of the Spirit. And if we're relating to the group without being influenced by the Spirit, it would just be an ugly display of selfishness. But if we, by the, by the power of the Spirit, are led and filled with the Spirit, His fruit will gently flow through us to those around us. If we are not actively pursuing resolution in relationships and mediating for others, can we really say that we are part of the church or that we are 
a church? What grade would you give our church in the area of mediation? What grade would you give yourself? The church is to be a place of peace. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and same judgment. And in Acts 9.31, it says, So the church throughout all Judea, Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Are you a peacemaker? Or would you rather make pieces? The Prince of Peace calls us to pick up the broken pieces and create and restore peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. The church then, of course, is led by the Prince of Peace and should, uh, I believe it goes without saying, should exude peace. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Not only should we strive for peace, but as we go closer to the Lord, there should be an equal growth in our ability to be unoffendable. We should not be offended. I am easily offended or tripped up when I'm thinking only of myself. When Jesus, was Jesus offended when he was on trial or when he was on the cross and the crowds were mocking him? Was he offended? The Bible tells us that he was full of compassion. It is nearly impossible to be filled with compassion for an individual and yet be greatly offended by them. Offense comes when I selfishly think only of me. So not only should we be peaceful, but we should be unoffendable and full of compassion. What grade would you give our church in the area of being willing to be agents of healing? Relationally, physically, spiritually, are we unoffendable? What grade would you give yourself? If we are not binding up wounds and if we are not caring for the hurting and being agents of healing, can we really say that we are a church? Is our church a place of peace and unity of spirit? The church should also be a place of growth. Now, growth includes several things. It includes learning through teaching and experience. I think... Um, it also includes admonishing, correction. We heard about discipline and repentance. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. In Hebrews 10.24, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Teaching should be a vital part of the church. 1 Corinthians 4, 14, 19 says, Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Teaching and learning should be a part of church. Now, growth also includes admonition, giving direction, and discipline. We read the verse in Matthew 18 where it says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Have you been helping with the maturity level of this congregation? Are you open to being matured by others? Am I easily offended, and do I become defensive when a brother points out an area of weakness or even questions my character? 
If I respond in hostility, it is absolutely a reflection of my low level of maturity. When the Lord saw Zacchaeus in the tree, he said, I'm coming to your house. And we're not told what the Lord told Zacchaeus, but we are told the results. And Zacchaeus wasted no time uh, repenting. He quickly made the necessary changes and made things right. Now, the response of the Pharisees was quite different, and in their arrogance, they not only refused to change, but they uh, conspired to kill the one who wanted to give them life. We need to be more like Zacchaeus, who was willing to change his life on a dime. When he met the Lord, he was willing to change. He was willing to allow the Lord to speak to him and show him his weak points. What grade would you give our church in the area of healthy growth, discipline, and teaching? Have we built up walls of resistance to receiving advice and counsel of those around us? What grade would you give yourself in this area? Are you willing to change and grow at the request of others? Are you willing to promote growth in others? Or are you satisfied with watching them flounder around in an area where you see the need for growth in their lives. Another area of growth is what Josh was talking about, exercising our gifts. And it talks about the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and the different members that make up the body and their gifts are to be used. These gifts, I believe, are to be used in the context of the body of Christ, the church of Christ. You're given a gift for a purpose of building up the body of Christ. Are you using it? If you're refusing or neglecting to use the gift God bless you with, you will create a breach in the body, a disconnect in the body. And the church is designed to be complete and mature, a perfect body, intact and fully functioning. But if I do not allow God to work through me, using the gift that he has given me, I create a disconnect. It opens a way for disease and infection to set in, and if left to fester, can grow to the point of the body working against itself. And I think because of this, because of people not exercising their gifts and rather being critical, churches today are plagued with spiritual autoimmune disorders. We must exercise the gift that God has given. One thing for certain is that the church will grow, much like our human bodies. If we do not exercise our gifts, we become spiritually obese. We become lethargic and lazy, content to soak in the blessing of the Lord without ever exercising our gifts. We become insulated by layers of fat that crowd out other organs, other parts of the body, creating an imbalance and overweight church. Is our church exercising the gifts we were given, or are we lethargic and cynical? Are we content to sit around without exercising? 1 Timothy 4.8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having the promise of life that now is and of that which is to come, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, Impurity, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Have you been neglecting the gift that God has given you? If we don't together exercise our gifts within the body, the body suffers. And what grade would you give our church in our ability and willingness to use our gifts? What about grading yourself? Have you been using your gift? 
have I been using my gift? The church is also a place of worship. And this is my last point. First, First Corinthians eleven twenty three to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Clear direction is given to the church to remember the suffering of Christ. It's part of our worship and admiration and adoration of him. In Acts, it says, they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Ephesians 5, 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your, with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. We are to be a church that worships Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with song shall I praise him. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them, Acts 16, 25. In Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Is our church a place of worship? Are we lifting up the name of our Savior? And are we worshiping in every circumstance, as Paul and Silas did? Are you participating in worship? Do you adequately prepare your mind and heart for worship? Or are you too distracted to participate? If we as a church are not worshiping, can we really be called a church? And if I am not worshiping, can I really claim to be part of the church? There are many more areas and activities that the church is to be involved in. We've only covered a few. But I'd like for you to think about our church, the strengths and weaknesses that we have, the good and the bad. And we could ask, what is our GPA? But more importantly, what is the attitude or the priorities that need to be changed or repented of in order to change, in order to do better? What is hindering us from reaching the lost? and to bring honor and glory to our head, Jesus Christ. I think I'd personally welcome feedback from some of you, or all of you, but I know some of you would be interested in thinking of other areas that our church needs to improve, or strengths that we have, and what the underlying attitudes or misplaced priorities are that hinder us. And I'd be, I'd be glad to hear from you. And I'm sure you'll do it graciously, but keep in mind this quote from uh, Dave Stolzfus, who I've heard say this several times. If you see an area of weakness in our church, you are probably the best person suited to fill it. And I think we'll just stop with that challenge that we as a church need to see the areas of weakness that we have in our church and in our own lives and then fill those voids. Will you kneel with me for prayer? (laughs) 
Father, I thank you for the teaching that you have in Scripture uh, that gives us direction on what a church and a healthy church should look like. And I pray for the church here at Weavertown that we would grow in maturity and in our devotion and, and reverence and honor towards you. Help us to be complete and whole. Help us to provide healing and restoration, uh, nurture and support to um, all members here. And I pray that you would give us wisdom as we do that. I pray for needs that we have, areas of weakness that we need to improve on, and the attitudes that, that we carry that need to be repented of so that we can better bring honor and glory to you. I pray that you give us the courage and the strength to make those changes in our personal lives and together as a group so that we can bring uh, more and more honor and glory uh, to you. Thank you for dying for us on the cross. Thank you for um, your willingness to suffer uh, to give your life so that we can have life. And may we be able to provide hope and healing and restoration to our church, to our community and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen.